everyone. We are so excited for this conversation today. We will be speaking about military relocations, what I call PCSing and state homeschool laws. You got to get a military acronym in there, right? To start us off. So serving our military is such an honor and a privilege. I'm biased about that though, as a recently retired Naval chaplain spouse. Thanks so much for joining us. Would you be willing to go ahead and share this live right now in your homeschooling community so we can expand our reach? So as you come in, let us know where you are watching from as well. So this is our sixth military Facebook Live. So I'm excited to say that number six. So go back and catch the other ones if you have missed them. My name is Natalie Mack and I wear a dual hat. I am the HSLDA Outreach Coordinator for the military and I'm also a high school educational consultant. And as I mentioned also, I am a retired Navy chaplain's wife and a homeschooling mom of five. Four of those five have graduated, gone on to college woo -woo, and graduate school. And I have a current ninth grader. So to all my fellow military homeschooling parents joining us on Facebook, we're so glad you're here. Will you let us know, like I mentioned, where you're joining from as you come in? Uh, and also be sure to put any questions that you have for TJ Schmidt, one of our awesome HSLDA attorneys and myself in those comments. And we'll save time to go over those later on. So although this webinar is titled Military Relocations, we know that other families relocate on a fairly regular basis as well, such as those who work for Department of State, DOD civilians, missionary families, and world schoolers, to name a few. We know, I, I know I missed a few other categories. So one of the most frequent questions that both our attorneys and our dynamic consultant staff receive is, what state law should I follow? So here we are today to discuss that. And who better to answer these questions than one of our HSLDA attorneys? So I asked TJ Schmidt to join me today for this conversation on relocation and state homeschool law. TJ is the contact attorney here at HSLDA for the states of Arizona, Florida, Indiana, Kentucky, New Mexico, New York, Oklahoma, and Oregon but he can discuss the general procedures for relocating and how crossing state boundaries may or may not impact our homeschooling. So let's get started. TJ, would you share a little bit about yourself, your family, your work as an HSLDA attorney? Well, sure. Well, thanks, Natalie, for uh, welcoming me and uh, having uh, this time together. I think it's going to be a great opportunity for us to talk to many of our military families and Hopefully those of you who uh, have some questions will be answered today. Uh, I see a lot of people joining us from all over the country, Germany, Virginia, yes. uh, North Carolina, wow. it looks like even Wyoming. So welcome yes. everyone. Awesome, Camp Lejeune too. We were at yeah. New River. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just to share a little bit about myself, uh, Natalie, both my wife Susan and I were homeschooled almost all of our lives. Um, awesome. We have seven children currently. Uh, that we're homeschooling. I, I really should say that my wife's homeschooling. She does the, the vast majority of our homeschooling for us. And uh, we have our children from uh, kindergarten all the way up to a senior mm -hmm. this year. So uh, my wife's getting quite the workout yeah. in the homeschool program. Now, I've had the privilege of working at HSLDA for over 19 years. Uh, I started out as a legal assistant and now as a contact attorney. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm one of the staff contact attorneys here at HSLDA, and it's my responsibility uh, to assist families in eight states, uh, but I also help non-member families all across the country uh, when they have issues or, or urgent needs. Uh, obviously, while HSLDA is primarily a membership organization, we do try to help uh, non-member families uh, with homeschooling issues whenever we can. So most of what I do is help educate both parents uh, and also school officials, even social services about, you know, what's legally required uh, to homeschool in that particular state. But then we also uh, obviously advocate and defend a family's right to teach their children at home. Um, and so there's, 
there's plenty of situations that we deal with uh, every day uh, where we have to step in and kind of prevent harassment and just outright infringement of a parent's right to teach your children at home. So I'm just really excited to be here and uh, really privileged to work at HSLDA. We are awesomely excited for you to be here as well. This is great. Okay, because this has been something that families have been asking for. And so I'm excited about it. So I have prepared a series of questions to ask you. Questions that are likely often asked by military families, missionary families, and other families constantly on the move. So in the high school educational consultant department where I wear the other hat, we assist parents with a multitude of questions about transcripts, our free transcript reviews, GPA calculations, and curriculum, to name a few. But we also refer families to you and to the other attorneys who say, we have orders to move to Florida in the middle of the year. Help! What do we do? I don't know what to do. So we would love for you to just talk a little bit about that. And um, I'm also encouraging as you all come in, viewers come in, please go ahead and drop comments in the questions. We're gonna take a little bit of time to answer those at the end and let us know where you're watching from. I see some have. So let's begin with clarifying a distinction. I'm often asked, do I have to follow the laws for my home of record? But this is not an accurate question. It is not home of record that you're concerned about because home of record is the state that you entered the military from. And it does not ever change unless you leave the military and re-enter. But the state of legal residence is what military personnel can declare and they can keep it even though they are posted to many different states. So according to military.com, a state of legal residence or domicile or legal domicile is the place where the service member thinks of as home, the state where you intend to live after you leave the military. So here's the question, and this is more <laughs> accurate. Do I have to follow state laws if it is not my state of legal residence? Yeah, so Natalie, that's a, a great question, and I think one that we do hear a lot from our military families. And the answer is generally yes, you do need to stay, follow the state laws where you're physically located. So while both men and women who are serving in the military can declare their state of legal residence, and this provides you with certain privileges and benefits, it's you know that declaring of uh, your legal state of, of residence doesn't mean that you can just follow the state laws of that state when you're posted to a different state. You know, typically you just follow the laws of the state that you're physically located in. Now there could be a couple exceptions. Um, you know, for instance, if you, uh, not uncommon in military families, if, you know, say your spouse is posted overseas um, and you go and live uh, maybe for a couple weeks with some family members or um, you know, so you're, you're traveling uh, in between posting to another state for a temporary, um, you know, just for a few weeks, you're not going to necessarily have to comply with the, the laws of that state. It's really where you're physically located, um, you know, for that posting, then that's where you would. Now, of course, there also could be an exception if you're posted overseas. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever you have these situations and there's any questions that you have, hey, what state should I comply with? Do I need to comply with this? state or country, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit further on, is reach out to HSLDA. Give us a call. Uh, the legal team here at HSLDA for your state or international team can help answer all these questions. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's why as consultants, we send those questions to you all. We appreciate you. Definitely. So, okay. Um, on January 6, 2006, President Bush signed the public law 109163. It's the National Defense Authorization Act, and it was for fiscal year 2006. And so it specifically um, required all four branches of the armed forces to institute a uniform recruitment policy for homeschool graduates, right? And to make sure that policy is communicated down to the recruiting officers. And so the question that frequently comes up is, 
about junior ROTC. Can you explain that current status? I get that often, often asked. Yeah, sure. And so with the JROTC, um, we've had a number of problems over the years with, uh, you know, families who've wanted both military and non-military families who've wanted to, you know, have their student participate in a JROTC uh, program. Uh, what I can say is, thankfully, uh, just with the, the recent National Defense Authorization Act in 2020, all homeschool students are now eligible to participate in the local JR, uh, JROTC program within their local public school. So actually under Section 513 or 513 of the National Defense Authorization Act, the United States Code was amended to specifically state that each public secondary educational institution that maintains a JROTC unit shall permit membership in that unit to homeschool students residing in the area served by that institution. So in other words, if you live within the attendance zone of that local public school that has a JROTC unit, then you can participate. Um, <clears throat> and that they, uh, you're qualified for membership within that unit. Uh, the only thing that you don't have to do is actually enroll or attend that public school to be able to participate. You can do that regardless as a homeschool student. Now, the, the code, the United States Code was also amended to provide that homeschool students would count towards that minimum number of students required to maintain that JROTC unit. So in a lot of um, units I know over the years, they've struggled to get the appropriate numbers. And, um, you know, what this means is that as a homeschooler, you can count towards that JROTC unit requ minimum requirements. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that will help in making sure that many of these uh, JROTC programs are open um, and actively recruiting homeschool students. Exactly, exactly. That's such good news. That's a common question, a common uh, interest that our students have, right? And they wanna be able to right. participate in that. So that's awesome. So let's move on to our next uh, question. And again, make sure you're putting comments or questions in, in the chat there. So homeschooling families have loads of books and other resources. I mean, we, my, my husband often laughs and says, do we need all of those books? Can you, can you offload some of them? No, I need every last one. There was always another child coming and you never knew what you were going to need. Right? So, so I always, as we moved around constantly, I, I always appreciate that we were able to count our resources in with the P, B, P, and E, which is basically pro gear, right? But other families haven't been so lucky and there's such a variety of responses about that. So what's the official policy about that? And is there something that HSLDA can do in cases where maybe that policy isn't followed or adhered to? Sure. Well, so as most of you probably know, if you're in the military, um, the military does limit how much weight of household goods or HHG that it'll ship for free based upon the service member's grade or rank. Uh, but every service member is allowed to ship professional books, papers, and equipment, or PB, P, and E, as it's often <laughs> referred to now. <laughs> um, and that doesn't count towards your HHG allotment. Um, so that can be very valuable, obviously, uh, to be able to get your, your homeschooling paperwork to be classified as, um, you know, PBN, uh, PB, P, and E. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what the, what the, uh, the actual um, joint travel regulations, and this would be under joint travel regulations uh, 051304, and we'll, we can send you a link to these actual regulations, but what it actually says is that a service member can request through the secretarial process that the PB, P, and E uh, belongings uh, of their spouse be shipped at government expense on a PCS move. So if that spouse is approved, you're allowed up to 500 pounds um, of materials under the PB, P, and E. Um, now, we've written over the years, I know uh, personally I've written probably uh, two or three letters at least that I can remember uh, to help a military service member where they were having some difficulties in uh, advocating that their homeschooling materials, the fact that, you know, the, their materials that they were educating their child and complying with compulsory attendance law um, would be treated as PBP and E. Um, and so if you have any of those issues, if you have any problems, you know, please reach out to us, contact your, your HSLD team, 
and we should be able to write a letter on your behalf to advocate that yes, this um, these materials should be counted towards you as a military spouse um, and count your homeschooling your homeschooling paperwork. So uh, we will include that link uh, in the comments. And um, you know, again, if you have some issues, just let us know. Oh, that's awesome. That is really, really good news. So I hope all of our families heard that, that, you know, you have assistance, reach out, like uh, TJ said, to the attorneys to get assistance if you encounter that. So I know that's a common concern. We have, like I said, so many resources and we, we really would, it just would be such a help, right, to be able to count that. So we appreciate that. Thank you for clarifying that too, TJ. So let's move on to moving overseas. Some of us love to go, some say, no, I don't want to go. But it, either way, it can be an exciting adventure, but we're often concerned about which laws will need to be followed. So let's talk about this. When we were last stationed as a family overseas, we were in Southern Italy, in Naples, and my kids enjoyed the options to participate on the high school sports teams. So would you clarify the rules about this for our families who are either overseas currently or anticipating moving overseas? Yeah, sure. So uh, under the DODEA policy, and this would be uh, 1375.01, all students who are educated in a homeschool setting are allowed to use or receive auxiliary services from either a DODA Europe or DODA Pacific school that they'd be eligible to enroll in. Um, and then according to the DODEA, the definition of auxiliary services includes access to academic resources, school information centers or school libraries, after school use of, of facilities, uh, participation in music, sports, and other extracurricular activities and interscholastic sports. Uh, and then also under this policy, homeschool students can also enroll in courses and or access educational, you know, special education, or related services in accordance with existing regulations and policies. Now, as most of you probably already know, when you are posted, particularly uh, overseas, they may ask questions about whether your child has special educational needs. And this is in part to make sure that the military is complying with this DODEA policy. But again, this DODEA policy is 1375.01. Um, and, and it allows you to participate basically on an equal level or equal footing with any other student who would be um, eligible to be enrolled. Now, some of the DODA schools, um, they have a, a cap um, or that they, you have to pay tuition to attend the schools. Uh, those same rules would apply universally to any students, whether you know, you're attending the school or whether you're a homeschool student. Uh, there should be no additional burden simply because you're a homeschooler. Um, but you would just fall, have to follow the same policies that any other student would to be able to participate. Um, one thing, one comment that I would uh, like to make about the courses is typically this policy specifically says that you could enroll up to three uh, courses. Uh, and these would be just, you know, not extracurricular services or sports, but just actual okay. courses of that DODEA school. Okay. So again, uh, we can send you a link. Uh, for anyone who's interested, so you can check out the policy. It's a great detail uh, outlining just about any scenario that you might have. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see the questions are coming in. We're going to take some time at the end to answer as many of the questions as we can. We appreciate you putting them there. Um, let me see. What's the next? Okay. So far, Status of Forces Agreement. Let's talk about that. So I know if the sponsor has orders allowing the family to relocate as well, as and it is to a military installation in a country in which the SOFA agreement, the Status of Forces Agreement is in place, then this is different than in a non-SOFA country. So can you speak to these two scenarios? Yeah, I can uh, certainly try to. Um, as I as I told you earlier, Natalie, I would say the status of forces agreement. I'm no expert in all yeah, these, and this yeah. is a you know pretty complex area of law. But it's right. definitely something that we can help you know research and find out for you if this is applying to you. Right. So as most of you know, um, SOFA or status of forces agreement are really part of a comprehensive security arrangement with foreign countries uh, that establish certain rights. Um, and understandings with U.S. military personnel and their dependents. 
Uh, so among other things, um, you know, the SOFA provides a clear outline how civil and criminal laws are going to be enforced against military families and their dependents. Um, you know, oftentimes these agreements affect both the status, the entry uh, and departure from that host nation, uh, mm -hmm. driving privileges, employment, mail, housing, and much more. Um, you know, currently the U.S. has, I believe, over 100 SOFA agreements or the equivalent with foreign countries, and about half of those are under the uh, NATO SOFA, which dates back to 1951. Wow. Um, so typically when you're an SOFA country, um, it's, you know, as a military dependent, you have an SOFA, you know, stamp or certificate on your passport, which mm -hmm. identifies you as uh, someone who can claim rights under that agreement. Um, now, most of the SOFAs do require the military members and dependents respect the law of that receiving state mm -hmm. uh, and up to abstain from uh, any activity that's inconsistent with the spirit of that present agreement. Mm -hmm. And in particular, any form of political activity in that receiving state, as you'd expect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, usually the receiving state has uh, jurisdiction over military personnel and their dependents uh, over civil and criminal offenses committed in that state. Uh, and this could include provisions of educational law. Uh, however, what I would say, I mean, so that, that specifically is what, what would okay. potentially apply to you as a homeschooler. But I would say in most countries, military families or their dependents can homeschool in accordance with your state of legal residence back in the U.S., while you're living overseas. Um, mm -hmm. Most of these SOFAs don't specifically uh, dictate that you have to comply with, um, you know, the education law of that state. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you um, are going to a country with an SOFA, uh, you should talk with our international team here at HSLDA and we can uh, advise you as far as, you know, what, what your options are. Most military families find that they can continue to homeschool overseas. Uh -huh. um, now, if you're if you're a military family or dependent in a country where there's no SF, SOFA, uh -huh. you're going to be treated basically as a, a foreign visitor in that country. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, you would you would need to uh, likely communicate with the military about, uh, you know, kind of what the potential impacts are. But again, as far as it specifically relates to homeschooling, check with us here at HSLDA. We have military families all across the country, all across the world, um, and many of them are homeschooling, um, even in states or countries where homeschooling is not generally permitted for, uh, you know, say the native uh, population in that, in that country. Right. So um, we do have a bunch of uh, resources and, um, you know, you can you can get a copy of the SOFAs in many of the countries. Uh -huh. uh, the State uh -huh. Department actually has uh, most of these available for you. So um, hopefully we'll provide those links to you. Uh, and so if you're watching and this applies to you, you can check these out. Awesome. Awesome. Great, 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 great. So I so appreciate you taking the time to clarify so many of our common questions. So a final one before we address the questions and the comments from our viewers. One of the frequent questions we, we receive in high school educational consulting is, how do I create a high school transcript if we move during those four years to a state that requires more? Yeah, so Natalie, this again is a very common question. Um, so what I would say is just as you comply with the laws of the state that you're physically located in, you should base your graduation requirements on the state that you and your family uh, are located in. Uh -huh. Now, what I would point out is that there's only a very few states that actually require homeschool students to complete a certain number of credits to graduate from high school. So most states don't specifically require or mandate that homeschool students complete, you know, X number of credits. That's right. Now, um, what I would say, though, in those states that don't require any specific requirements, you're going to usually or typically use the public school graduation requirements as a guide as you mm -hmm. seek to educate your child at home. So you're kind of using that as a, a general ruler to say, OK, this is what our state requires to graduate from high school. And we're mm -hmm. going to do something that's comparable or mm -hmm. roughly equivalent. 
-hmm. So even though you're not bound by those high school graduation requirements, it's just a good idea to be aware of what they are and to be able to document that your child has completed a program that's roughly equivalent. Mm -hmm. Now, generally, this just means that um, you're going to look at the overall number of credits that are required, you know, if it's 20 or if it's 22 or 24, you're just going to use that as your general guide or rule. Again, though, um, one thing that I would say is, you know, if you have any of these questions, contact us. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, it's, it's really important if your child graduates early, or, or perhaps more important if your child graduates early to make sure that you can document that those credits are necessary and that they've, they've been completed. Right. Um, you know, so if you if your child graduates from high school at 16 uh -huh. and compulsory school age is 18, uh -huh. um, you know, you being able to document that they've met at least 22 credits or 24 credits right. uh, is going to, you know, be able to uh, justify and, and um, you know, really get the local, any government school officials off your back if they're trying to, you know, criticize, well, hey, how come you're not reporting? Right. Now, I think, though, that one of the one of the key things in this is uh, a lot of military families, you know, you're, you're moving maybe when your child's a senior or yeah. maybe even they have, um, you know, they they finished school at 17. Uh, but in the new and the compulsory school age was 16 in that state. Right. And now you're moving to a new state that, you know, uh, compulsory school age is 18. Right. Uh, you know, do they need to go back to high school <laughs> because they're they're 17? They're not 18. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I would say if your child completes their homeschooling program in accordance with your, you know, uh, state that you just left, mm -hmm. uh, you shouldn't have to, you know, add additional requirements when you move to a new state. Okay. Uh, again, that periodically comes up. Um, and if you can demonstrate that they've, you know, they've met the requirements from your previous state, uh -huh. then uh -huh. you should not have to, you know, initiate any kind of homeschool program in that state, even if, if your child, you know, decides to go into college uh -huh. in that, you know, new state, uh, we would be able to assist you and say, okay, no, you know, we, we just left, um, you know, Florida, for instance, and we're now in California. We completed what Florida would have expected. And in fact, I just uh, wrote a letter not too long ago on behalf of a member family that had that very situation. So, um, those are those are situations that do come up from time to time. Uh, again, generally, um, in most states, you're not required to complete a certain number of credits. You uh -huh. Use the state high school graduations as a general rule of thumb. Uh -huh. um, but you would want to kind of look at the state that you're physically located in uh, if your child has not finished high school. So good. hopefully that provides good. some clarity information. Good, good, good. And it's great because if, if you need more clarity about any of, of these questions or, or anything, then definitely, like TJ has said, reach out to uh, the HSLDA team. Um, definitely, that's what we are all here for. So I want to take a little bit of time now because I see comments and questions coming, which is exciting. That's what I, we asked for because I know we tried to come up with what we what I've been asked commonly and what TJ and but we know there's still specifics. And if we can't specifically address, then contact us, um, you know, and we can we can get some answers to you. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and start at the top, TJ, um, in the comments there. So first off, I see I'm excited to see Germany. And uh, so that's great because I did try to share it to several communities around the world. Um, Hampton Rose, Camp Lejeune. So you have a 11th grade, one ninth and one fifth. Welcome, Robin. Um, Dr. Douglas is here with us. Thank you as always for supporting and Tiffany from Hawaii. So let's see if we have any questions here. Fort Bragg as well, Susan. Susan has a question. If the state I'm residing in requires state history for graduation, do I have to adhere to that if we haven't lived in the state for all mm -hmm. of high school? Sure. Well, so I think there's two components to that question, Susan. One would be, um, is that specifically required for homeschool students? Uh, as I said at the beginning um, of our question about this, most homeschool uh, students don't have specific graduation requirements that they must complete or, mm -hmm. or do. Um, and so uh, I know in a couple of the states that I'm responsible for here at HSLDA, uh, public school students have to meet a certain 
um, you know, classes or criteria. And in many of those states, homeschool students do not need to worry about those requirements. But what I would say is um, if you're uh, in a state, I think uh, one state in particular that I know of, uh, New York State, does require homeschool students to cover uh, both uh, U.S. history and New York State history. Uh, and so if your child has not graduated or completed uh, their homeschool program and you move to that state, uh, even if it's maybe their senior year, uh, then I would recommend that you uh, ensure that they you know, comply with that requirement and that they meet that. Uh, generally speaking, uh, all that requires um, New York, for instance, doesn't mandate that you do a whole credit or whole course uh, in that, but that you can just you do have to cover uh, U.S. history and New York State history. So again, it could be a much more abbreviated course than perhaps a, a full uh, credit course that would be required. Again, uh, in in your particular state, we can we can check with that. And I think, um, you know, we can definitely follow up. Uh, and I think Susan, you, you're from North Carolina, so uh, I don't know North Carolina right off the top of my head, but we can have our North Carolina team follow up with you as well. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, TJ. Um, so Robin McMurray, welcome. She says access to athletic teams here at Lejeune High School as a homeschooler requires that students take at least four courses at the high school. That seems to defeat the purpose of homeschooling. <laughs> yeah, so um, there are a number of states, only about half of the states allow uh, or entitle uh, students to participate in extracurricular activities. Now, while we were talking earlier about homeschool students' uh, eligibility to participate on equal access, you know, sports and extracurricular activities for any mm -hmm. DODEA school that they'd be entitled to attend, mm -hmm. if you're if you're based stateside, you would have to comply with whatever the the state laws are. Um, and so, only about half of the states allow students to participate in extracurricular activities, whether you're in the military or not. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I know that that many states um, over the years have been uh, allowing homeschool students to participate in extracurricular activities. Uh -huh. um, uh, and in the states that do allow it, uh, uh -huh. you're, you're generally not required to meet that minimum state class participation. I believe North Carolina is one of the states that does require that. And that basically uh, rules out homeschool students being able to participate um, uh -huh. Now, there are some states where you can participate as a part-time student. Uh -huh. So, for instance, in Washington State, I know uh, you can take, um, you know, a class or two uh, and participate. Uh -huh. uh, in New Mexico, for instance, you're also allowed to take one class uh, uh -huh. and then also, you know, participate in extracurricular activities. Uh -huh. Again, if that state requires that you, you have a certain number of participation and it allows uh -huh. it uh, for homeschool students, then you could you could do that, um, but I agree with you. Um, if they're wanting you to to participate, uh, that many classes, you know, are you really still a homeschooler? Uh, in 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 New York State, for instance, uh, you have to participate in eighty percent of the classes, uh, and they do not allow part time uh, enrollment. So it effectively rules out homeschool students from participating in extracurricular activities for high school. So again, yeah. it's, it's about half of the states that will allow it. That will allow it. One thing I would distinction I wanted to ask you specifically about Robin is because we were at New River. So I know, and I think she added a comment at the end, Lejeune High School is actually on Camp Lejeune. So it is one of okay. the states that has, a, has that in, within CONUS, right? That has a right. Dodia school. So I think her question is framed in reference to it being a Dodia school. I guess she's just wondering about that requirement. Right. So if it is a DODA school, and I apologize, I didn't catch that, um, oh, okay. is, that is the fact that um, you are exempt specifically under that policy that I mentioned, uh, and that would be DODA policy uh, 1375.01. Right. Uh, and it specifically says under, looking at it right now, under... Mm -hmm. um, uh, da, 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 da. Well, I can pull that out, but it specifically uh -huh. says uh -huh. that you're exempt from having to um, take classes, right? Pay, well, right, to be able to be enrolled in 
um, that classes you shouldn't you should not be required to enroll in those classes. We can follow right. up more uh, closely though with you, Robin, so that if mm -hmm. we need to reach out mm -hmm. uh, to the local uh, school administrators there that we can try to help you in that matter. Yeah, definitely, Robin. Reach out to us, and um, you can reach, for example, obviously, I would. You can reach TJ, or you can reach out to me at military at hslda.org. I will send it over to to the attorney for um, for North Carolina. I have it as um, is that Amy? I think I have it as Amy. I'll send it over there. So just contact us, Robin, about that. Um, Joy says, what if you are stationed at a CONUS duty station? So here in the U.S., continental U.S., is there anything you are allowed that is not just the normal things that other homeschoolers can do? Well, um, so I'm not sure I understand the complete question, but if you're part of a CONUS duty station, uh, you, you're asking whether there's anything allowed that, that's just not the normal thing that other homeschoolers um, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the specifics of that question. So maybe, Joy, you can provide a little bit more clarification. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, the DODA um, policy, as I referenced before, uh, specifically has language in there that homeschooling is to be treated as a legitimate, a valid educational option. That mm -hmm. should be true, you know, here in the United States, if you're, you know, um, you know, on any kind of military installation. Mm -hmm. uh, your the fact that you're educating your child in the compliance with that state laws uh, or requirements, uh, you should be treated as any other uh, student, and not right. and should not be discriminated against in any manner uh, because you've chosen uh, an alternative educational method. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe Joy, you can follow up with some specific clarity on that question. Again, mm -hmm. though, feel free to contact us directly. And I know uh, either myself or one of the other attorneys or legal teams here at HSLDA, you know, can certainly try to provide you that clarification. So I see someone uh, joining from Naples, Italy, which still has my heart. I <laughs> uh, was stationed there for three years. So joining from Naples, Italy with our youngest child in Classical Conversations Challenge A. My dear friend Lisa Rosca was on a previous Facebook Live here and she set up that classical conversations there, TJ, over in Naples. So in Hawaii, we had to register as homeschooling with the middle school we were zoned for. Where do I find out requirements for Dodd Schools OCONUS? Yeah, so um, the best way to do that would be to reach out directly to our uh, international team here at HSLDA, um, and they can uh, provide that information to you. Um, I think the, um, you know, if you're on a, a CONUS uh, location, sometimes they do require you to, um, you know, just verify that the ch a child of compulsory school age is, you know, being educated, whether it's at a DODA school or other facility um, in country <clears throat> or homeschooling. Mm -hmm. So reach out to our international uh, HSLD team. Um, and they can definitely, Mike Donnelly is one of our staff contact attorney. He assists uh, international families, uh, all countries around the globe, many of our military families overseas as well. Um, so, um, you know, typically with the DOD, when you're internationally, they just require you or want you to verify that you're in compliance. I suspect uh, that what you'll be able to do in Italy is that uh, you can just homeschool in accordance with your uh, legal state of residence back here in the United States. Um, and whether that was Hawaii or whether that was another state uh, that you declared, um, you know, we'll be able to help you uh, work that out. And again, I would suggest you contact the uh, international uh, HSLD legal team. That would be Mike Donnelly and... Um, forgotten the legal assistance name at the moment, but yeah, <laughs> I can yeah. definitely help you out. Right. Yeah. We have a full staff, right? So it's, it's quite a, quite a, uh, quite a lot of people. So uh, Don also asked specifically in Hawaii, she was required to take Hawaii standard testing taken at the middle school. I haven't been able to find out the requirements for the Dodd school in Naples, Italy. Right. 
right? Yeah. Well, and, and Dawn also mentioned that she's uh, home state is uh, the state Florida. of legal residence is Florida. So obviously uh, Florida, you know, just simply requires that you do an annual assessment uh -huh. uh, each year. And uh -huh. you can do that a couple different ways. Uh, probably the easiest for you would be, um, you know, to have a, a, a achievement test. Uh -huh. um, all the all Florida law requires is that you do um, a, a standardized achievement test administered by a certified teacher. Uh, that doesn't require it to be in person. Uh -huh. But if you do have a uh, maybe a, a certified teacher there uh, that you can use in Italy, or many of the uh, testing service providers do remote or online administration. Uh -huh. um, and uh, particularly in Florida, uh -huh. um, many of the certified teachers will do administration of a test remotely over Zoom. Uh -huh. um, but there is also another option under Florida law, which would be that you're part of a, a Florida registered private school. And so that might be the simplest option for you that you would just uh, enroll your child in a, a private school registered with the Florida Department of Education. Um, and then you could provide that documentation uh, there in uh, in Italy. So uh, again, follow up with our uh, international legal team uh, here at HSLDA, and they can walk you through. And I'm the contact attorney here for Florida, so I can uh, work with them and you to make sure that we uh, get you the best option available. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to also say, Don, um, I would recommend... Um, well, when, when we were stationed in Naples, we did standardized testing as a group with the Naples Christian Homeschoolers. I don't know if you are a member of that group, but I know it still exists. Um, I was president and I'm still in contact with them, as well as check the, with your SLO, your school liaison officer that may be able to assist you. If that doesn't help, reach out to us like TJ has said, we'll, we'll get you connected, okay? Now, yeah. Um, yeah, and Don mentioned the Stanford 10. So yeah, the Stanford 10 is one that is often used. Uh, okay. It is an online test. Uh, Homeschool Testing Services, which HSLD is a partner with, uh, administers the Stanford 10, as does Seton Testing based in Virginia. Uh, both of them do the Stanford 10. Um, yeah, and the school liaison officers, um, I've had the privilege of uh, providing a couple of uh, training seminars for school liaison officers all across the country. And many of them are uh, not quite sure what to do in those situations. So uh, again, connect with our international team and we'll definitely try to help you out. Now, I, um, Natalie, you're probably gonna get to Sherry's question. Yes, go ahead, yes. Yeah, don't about, get um, you know, how you're bound by the laws of a state that you're not residing in. Well, as we kind of talked about earlier, uh, typically, when you're stateside, you want to comply with the laws that you're physically located in. That's the state mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would would uh, you know kind of regulate compulsory school age, compulsory attendance, uh, mm -hmm. homeschooling laws. Even though you may have a different declared state of residence, legal residence mm -hmm. as a military personnel, but when right. you're inter when you're overseas and when you're international, and in some jurisdictions, in fact, in, in many of them, uh, unless they're uh, you know, SOFA uh, applies, mm -hmm. you would be able to uh, claim your uh, legal state of residence as this state that you're complying for homeschooling law. Even though you may not be reporting to them, you're following the same requirements. In other words, doing an annual assessment, mm -hmm. keeping a portfolio, keeping records or things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, it's not necessarily that it would be legally required, but it would be for ease of use for that military personnel. Instead of having to comply with maybe that international uh, law uh -huh. or enroll your child in the school uh, uh -huh. in that country, uh -huh. uh, you as military personnel, and we could help you, uh, simply declare that, no, I'm gonna be following the homeschooling regulations of my legal state of residence, uh -huh. say Florida, um, and use that, um, you know, to establish, you know, the process by which you're homeschooling. Uh, there are many states that um, will actually allow military personnel to, um, you know, kind of claim their, um, you know, claim certain educational privileges, even though you're military and you're, you've been, you know, stationed at a new post. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Florida is one of those states and I've, I've helped a couple families uh, in that situation. So again, 
um, one of the things, Sherry, is you wouldn't necessarily be legally required to follow that state that you don't live in, but it may be beneficial for you to do so as a military family living overseas. Um, so in a non-sofa anyway. non situation, right? Well, right? And, and even in some sofa situations as well. Okay. I mean, it's just going to okay. depend on whether that sofa specifically has uh, provisions for educational law. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. So again, always talk with our international team here at HSL, HSLDA, and they right. can provide you with some clarity and information. Right, 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 right. Great, great, great. Um, you mentioned about the school liaison officer and how you've done training. So that's one of the things that we are working here with the military outreach program at HSLDA mm -hmm. is that we are reaching out to school liaison officers. So if you are a school liaison officer and you are watching this or you're are later catching the replay, please reach out to me. My email is posted because that is something that, like TJ mentioned, it's important that we work together on behalf of our military families, that they can have access to your expertise as a school liaison officer, and that we can share the appropriate, correct legal information with you so right. that you can do your job even more effectively. So that's right. awesome that you mentioned that. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Do you see any other questions? I don't see anything else. I see Don says, thank you. So I appreciate everyone. Thank you for all the questions. TJ, did you want to go ahead and you have any final words of wisdom for us? Well, certainly if there's no other further questions, uh, obviously, as Natalie's mentioned, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to post. But um, I think really the only thing that uh, I would want to kind of wrap up with is mm -hmm. that, you know, as we've kind of talked about, and as many of you know, um, you know, HSLDA is committed to defending, you know, the right of parents to educate their children at home. And it's our mission really to be able to advocate for the greatest freedom possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're wanting to assist you and your family, uh, obviously, as you are serving in the military or, or a military spouse. Uh, and uh, we want to be able to advocate on your behalf. Uh, and it's particularly true that we want to be able to assist you as you're serving our country. Uh -huh. So please don't hesitate to uh, contact us. Uh, please reach out to me. Uh, again, my name is TJ Schmidt. Uh, Natalie, of course, uh, or any of our you know legal staff, we're here to be able to provide you with assistance and obviously peace of mind uh, as you oftentimes have to transition from one state to another. So uh, one of the things that we have at HSLDA, if you've probably already discovered this, is we have a legal analysis for each of the 50 states. Uh -huh. uh, you can go to uh, hslda.org uh, forward slash um, laws, and you can find information about your uh, particular state or maybe a new state that you're considering to be uh, posted if you've got the privilege of choosing a couple of different states, uh, you can check out those states and find out what the homeschooling laws are in those states even before uh, you know your spouse uh, agrees to that posting. So again, uh, if there's anything that we can do, please let us know. Um, and uh, I would love to be able to assist you. Great, 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 great. I see real quickly before I close out, um, Terry is an MSEC military student consultant. Awesome. I've been reaching out to MSEC. So Terry, uh, would you contact me at military at hslda.org? You're working remotely with military families all over the world. I would love to uh, talk with you. Susan has last minute question. Do I need to keep old workbooks, et cetera, when we move? And that will be our last. Yeah. I like to purge each time. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, um, you know, one of the things that I would say is generally, um, you know, you're, if, you're, if your state law doesn't require you to keep records, then, you know, you, you don't have to keep old workbooks. Uh, many of the states have very minimal uh, paperwork uh, or no paperwork, you know, keeping requirements. Uh, Florida, for instance, requires two years. Um, I don't know of any state that requires more than that. Uh, our general recommendation would be is that you just keep records for this year and maybe perhaps for the previous year. Beyond that, uh, generally, unless your state law says otherwise, uh, you really would not need to keep old workbooks. The only really exception that I would maybe recommend is if you're homeschooling through high school, uh, mm -hmm. it's a good idea maybe to at least keep uh, maybe a list of the courses that you taught or, or the textbooks that you use because it will help you as you 
uh, as your child completes high school and as you write up their their transcripts, as you write up uh, kind of their their course descriptions mm -hmm. on the credits that they've earned through high school. Uh, one other reason might be uh, perhaps if your child uh, is going to apply for scholarships in high school, right. uh, you may want to keep uh, maybe a, a portfolio of sorts of some of their best work, uh, maybe some of the um, a paper that they wrote or research that they did or a science project that they did uh, that might be used for possible scholarships or other things. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, I was homeschooled almost all of my life. And uh, after I graduated, my mom gave me this little packet of things that she had kept, just little things that oh, she awesome. had, had she had kept from uh, dating back to second grade. Now, it wasn't thick, but it was just a few things that she had kept and pulled out. So uh, my kids kind of got a little kick out of that. But, um, you know, there's really no legal requirement that you would keep anything uh, dating back for, you know, since you've begun homeschooling. It's not like your tax records where you're recommended to keep seven years. Okay. Yes. And, and we mentioned, um, I, well, you and I were talking prior to coming on live, but um, last week I did an NCAA webinar. And so that, if, and that reminded me as you were mentioning and responding to Susan's question about papers and keeping and what you just mentioned, of course, with transcripts and course descriptions, if you have an athlete, then definitely you want to keep what you can so that you can quickly complete those, what we call CCWs, the core course worksheets. Um, it's too difficult to try to recall all the specifics of the classes over four years, right? So um, definitely great, great answer. Thank you, TJ, as always. Thank you. And then I see a last comment from Misha Ricks. Here at MSEC, we recently referred a family to your organization for specific state questions. Thank you for all you do to serve the homeschooling communities. Thank you, Misha. Definitely. I'm trying to reach out. I think Terry, I mentioned to reach out to to MSEC. So if you would like to reach out to me as well at military at hslda.org, that would be great. So we're going to wrap it up. I appreciate it. I see the links have been populated. Thank you. Um, this So we know this is a topic we could just keep talking about, right? There are so many specifics, and that's why TJ has offered for those that have more specific questions. Even if you're watching later the replay, reach out to us at HSLDA. But I hope this conversation was informative for all those that are watching. And I know as military homeschool families, we definitely face unique challenges and we can often feel disconnected and forgotten. So here at HSLDA, we are working hard to develop resources that will help you, the military family, find connection and encouragement. So we maintain a growing list of homeschool groups that you can search for, as well as overseas military support groups. We are in continuing to populate that. That's one of the things I'm also working on as military outreach coordinator is so if you are a state sub state support group leader, if you are um, a military specifically homeschool support group leader, please reach out to me again at military at hslda.org. I'm working with our group services attorney, Darren, to, to actually inform our military homeschool support groups of all of the awesome benefits that HSLDA uh, provides to, to homeschooling groups. And we want to populate and we want to get more of our military support groups in our directory. So please reach out to me. Also, obviously, you've benefited from our awesome uh, legal team, TJ Schmidt. We have educational consultants. I'm one of them. We have a whole slew of fantastic ones. We all help military families just like yours through questions and challenges that may come up in your homeschooling stateside, CONUS or OCONUS overseas. If you're not already a member, we would love for you to join us. So if you want, find out more at um, hslda.org forward slash join. That's HSLDA org forward slash join. I do have a military a URL that I need to put in the comments where you can actually reach out for the military discount for membership. Okay. And finally, thanks again, TJ and everyone else that has supported this. I appreciate you all joining us today and uh, have a wonderful day. Well, Natalie, glad to join you and uh, thanks for all that you do.
Thank you. Thank you.